God exists. No one would blame you for expecting evidence that supports that claim. Now, imagine you wake up to your two-year-old and four-year-old barging into your room saying, Happy birthday, mommy! We made you breakfast all by ourselves! What kind of images start shooting through your mind? What evidence would you expect to see to substantiate their claim once you walk downstairs into the kitchen? I'll give you a second to paint that canvas. The same is true for God. The scriptures say that God has shown humans his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and even his deity through creation, through what has been made. For example, Psalm 19 claims the heavens declare the glory of God, and Romans 1 says since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. So the Bible makes this claim. Is it supported? Is it true that creation itself provides evidence for its own creator? Well, when we do observe creation, we notice that there are multiple things that if God exists, we should expect to see. And so in this video, we will explore three simple facts supported by evidence that prove that this world is exactly how it should look if the God of the Bible exists. The first is this. If God exists, we should expect to live in a world that is just right to sustain life. This is called the Goldilocks principle, that the world is just right for life. There are countless ways that this could possibly be explored, but we're only going to look specifically at one idea, one central concept here, and that is Earth's position, movements, and interactions with space. Now, there's a lot to unpack here, so I'm going to speed run this. <gasps> The Earth rotates on an axis of 23.5 degrees, which is just right for Earth seasons and how they impact the planet. If the Earth were tilted differently by even just a few degrees, life itself would become impossible here. And it's the same thing with the distance from other celestial bodies. Just a little closer to the Moon, and we'd have tsunamis consistently wiping out whole parts of the Earth. Just a little closer to the Sun, and the temperatures on Earth would no longer be suitable for life. The precise pull of gravity on the Earth is no exception to all of this craziness. If our gravitational pull were changed by only 1 in 10 to the 40th power, that's 10 followed by 40 zeros, life would end. The Moon could come careening into the Earth or leave it orbit entirely, lost forever to the eternal abyss of space. And it would be negligent to not also mention the chemical composition of Earth's atmosphere. The sun, it turns out, is actually pretty harmful. It emits plenty of rays that could easily turn you into a crisp radioactive raisin faster than you can say theism is a logical position after all. Not to mention, if we had even 4% more oxygen in our atmosphere, fires would spontaneously combust across the Earth's surface. More crispiness. And if there were 6% less, humanity would suffocate. So not crispy, but not fun either. The Earth, as you might know, is a little spinny boy. It doesn't have the celestial hula hoop of Saturn, but it's still spins like a top. Now, if it were to spin any slower, it would create longer days which would bake the Earth in heat during the day and freeze it at night. If it spun any faster, wind velocities would exponentially increase until the entire thing looked like a cotton candy in a planet-sized blender. Suffice to say, our 24-hour days are just right for you to live. So the next time you desperately wish for more hours in the day, just remember that if that were true, it wouldn't be long before you had no more hours of the day. Because you die. To wrap this little section up, I must mention the placement of the solar system and Earth in our galaxy. See, if our solar system were further away from the center, we would be in a region where it's impossible for solid planets to even form. So that's not a good look for us. And even better, if we were closer to the center, we would be in constant danger of colliding with other stars, planets, asteroids, and plenty of other astronomical no-nos that would just absolutely ruin your whole day. This is what we call stellar density, and that means exactly what it sounds like. The closer you get to the galactic center, the closer everything gets. So not good. Ultimately, all of this is perfect for sustaining life. If any of these details changed up even a little bit, life as we know it would either be colossally more difficult or would not exist at all. Okay, enough about space. Let's get a little bit more down to earth, if you know what I mean. And as a matter of fact, let's take a close look at ourselves as humans. Inside here, there is an organ that weighs about three pounds or about 1300 grams, yet it holds computing power beyond any computer ever made. The sheer complexity of the nervous system demands a closer look at its possible origins. Inside your brain are 86 billion neurons connected by an estimated 100 trillion synapses. These all work together to keep you alive and functioning. Your medulla oblongata keeps your heart beating, your cerebellum keeps your balance working, and your cerebrum processes sound and vision, all without a single conscious thought. 
Even your breathing remains a subconscious action for most of the time. Not to mention, the hippocampus processes and stores memory with an enormous amount of data capacity. At least, we think it's the hippocampus. Science isn't even sure about that because of the complex functions of memory. We're hardly scratching the surface here of what your own brain does without you telling it to do anything. When you compound that complexity by looking at the conscious activities that your brain is responsible for, things get way deeper. The motor cortex in your brain is the center for motion control, which sends messages to the rest of the body unbelievably quickly, upwards of 100 meters per second. That's 275 miles per hour. And this functions both consciously and subconsciously. In the cerebellum is where muscle memory is stored, which means that eventually through training, one can have reflexes that operate seemingly subconsciously. That's how NASCAR drivers are able to make such perfect movements in a fraction of a second, why martial artists are able to react to high-speed strikes, and similarly, why we flinch when our siblings may fake a punch in our direction. So you may not be able to drive a pod racer as efficiently as nine-year-old Anakin Skywalker, but rest assured, your brain has your muscle memory stored and ready for use. There are so many parts of the brain that we have absolutely no clue about. Scientists have been trying to replicate the human brain for years in their studies and experiments and inventions with no success so far. The level of complexity makes the function of our brains perfect for living and interacting as relational and rational people on a day-to-day -day basis. There are so many examples of this complexity, both within humanity and without, but that would take years of videos to unpack in its fullness. Yet even with just the examples provided here, we see the sheer complexity that provides fine-tuned conditions for human life. And this is exactly what we would expect to see if God indeed exists. So now we're gonna turn away from science and into philosophy. In addition to the physical stuff around us, if the God of the Bible exists, we should also expect to see some common themes, some common stories, and perhaps even common tendencies throughout human history and human nature. This makes sense since, if the Bible is correct, we all came from two people who knew God personally, followed by generations of people who also knew their Creator, or at least knew of their Creator. If this is indeed the case, then there are several world events and figures that should be noted in histories across cultures due to their impact, not just in the Bible. And while there are many examples that could be listed, enough to fill an entire other video series, few are better than the Great Flood of Genesis. In this event, as accounted in Genesis 6 through 9, we see that the entire earth was eradicated of evil by means of a great flood. Now, there is much debate surrounding this flood, such as if it was local or worldwide, which species actually survived and in what way, and the method in which the layers were deposited, but once again, that's another video for another time. The point of this is, if this flood in Genesis really happened, then we should expect to see accounts of the flood in different cultures outside of the Bible because of oral tradition and histories being passed down. And it doesn't require a very close look at all to know that that's exactly what we find in history. Nearly every culture throughout history either has or had a global flood account. These are some of the most notable. The Epic of Gilgamesh accounts the story of Gilgamesh, the king of Uruk, and his exploits, including experiencing a great flood. In this story, a cube-shaped structure is built to survive the flood. However, a ship of this structure and of these dimensions would have been deadly for those trying to survive the rough seas inside. So we see a flood account, but with a very crucial flaw. From Hawaii comes the story of Nu'u, who built a great raft to save himself and many animals from a great flood. In this account, however, there simply would not have been remotely enough space on the boat to fit every creature that allegedly fit. Another account, another flaw. From China, we read about Fu Qi, who escaped a great flood with his family, a flood that was apparently, by legend, caused by an argument between a crab and a bird. The account then says that they repopulated the earth afterwards. The difference here is that the entire earth wasn't covered because the way this man survived was by simply retreating to a mountaintop. So there's no basic scientific flaw here, except of course that this was apparently caused by a celestial argument between a crab and a bird. Along with these accounts, there are many others from across the globe. The Greeks have multiple, but the standout would be Deucalion, who built a chest to survive the Great Flood. 
New Zealand has a global flood in their history, and my ancestors, the Norse, had Bergelmir, who built a vessel to survive a flood sent by the gods. The only difference between the biblical account of the flood and these others is that the biblical account is the most scientifically feasible. As one example, the seaworthiness of the Ark's dimensions, and particularly its ratio of 30 to 5 to 3. In case you'd like to explore this subject further, check out the documentary series linked in the description. The point here is that accounts of this great flood permeate nearly every culture on Earth. This should give us some clue as to the validity of the basic claims of these accounts. If God exists and the biblical account is true, then we should expect such monumental events to be recorded in not just scripture. Lo and behold, that is exactly what we see. So that's the history part. But what about human nature? If God exists, what should we expect to see? Well, it's logical to assume that if we truly are made in his image, as Genesis 1 claims, then we should share some of the basic qualities of him, right? Well, I believe that we can pinpoint many such qualities, but here we're only interested in three. The desire to create, the desire for relationships, and the desire for justice. One look at any civilization of any time is enough to convince us that we as people love to create. We love to build. We take pride in our creations. If you think about it, who really cares ultimately who has the tallest building or the fastest roller coaster? Without any emotions attached, without any pride, those questions are kind of funny if you think about it. Why does something moving faster seem better to us? Why does having something bigger than something else seem good to us? Well, it's because we have a desire and a love not just for creation, but good creation. And this goes beyond simply the competitive goodness of our creations. We must also consider the appreciation that we have inherently of the goodness of beauty. Several months ago, I had the pleasure of traveling across Europe. I saw 18 different countries, many of which had art museums. After having been to the Louvre, the British Museum, and many others, you know what was something that I never saw? A cow walking through appreciating the art. Why is it that we as humans are the only species who evolved an appreciation for beauty? I don't know about you, but I deeply enjoy metal music. However, I have yet to see a platypus in the mosh pit. We as a human race have a deep appreciation and, and a need for innovation, creativity, and beauty. We share this love for good creation with our Creator. In the Genesis account, God repeatedly says that His creation is good or very good. He did not half-heartedly create the world, nor did He carelessly create us. As a matter of fact, we read that He made us fearfully and wonderfully. This same desire to create is something that is good and wonderful and also exists within us. Now, it could be easy to look at any five-year-old boy breaking a window or smashing a Lego set and think, oh, maybe humanity doesn't love creating that much. And there will always be outliers and exceptions because we aren't copy and paste versions of each other. But within humanity, you can see a general common desire to create. Oh, and that masterpiece the kid destroyed? He was the one who created it to begin with. And he only smashed it because he wanted to create something better afterwards. If we accidentally evolved, why would we feel this need? Having a comfy bed and a meaningful job, truly meaningful, something that matters in your life and affects positively the people around you, doesn't affect your survival at all. At least as far as keeping your body alive. You could continue living by simply tidying up a cave and having a fire for warmth. And yet, here we are, desiring more than mere survival. We desire aesthetics, we desire relationships and value in our surroundings. This doesn't truly exist within animal cultures. Now, one may contradict me when I say that with examples like dolphins who apparently do things for fun, or animal cultures who build elaborate cave structures, etc., etc. However, even if we allow those exceptions without question, this point still stands. Why, you may ask? Well, for that, you'll have to wait for the last section of this video. The second part of human nature discussed here is the desire for relationships. Many have asked the question, why did God even create us in the first place? There's no way to know all of God's reasons, but 
we do know that God is relational. He desires a true relationship with his creation. We experience this with our loved ones, particularly with our spouses and our children. Just as the church is called the bride of Christ, and as God is called our Father in heaven, so we too experience relationships that are small examples of our various relationships with God. We would not expect this without God's existence. Within the animal kingdom, there are a few animals that choose a single partner for life, like certain species of swans and penguins, but the majority simply made at random with the purpose of the survival of their species. And even those who stay with a partner for life do not show the exact same signs of true relationship that we witness in humanity. If our origin is mindless, where did this desire come from? There's nothing that has to do with the survival of our species that comes from that. In fact, one could argue that slowing down to pursue deep relationships is counter to much of what people claim is the purpose of the supposed evolutionary process. Practically all of humanity, at all times, has placed high value on relationships, and has often looked down on having multiple partners. We would not expect this to be the case if God did not exist. The last trait of human nature that we'd like to discuss for now is the desire for justice. This can also be put as a desire for general rightness in the world. Now, of course, there are exceptions to this desire as there are those who have dulled their moral compass, but within the overwhelming majority of humanity, there is a desire for justice or rightness. And this is yet another thing that doesn't make sense if God doesn't exist. Stronger animals kill the weaker ones in nature all the time, and it even makes their genome stronger as they preserve the stronger members. If we were to take on that same view of humanity, unspeakable crimes would be committed, and under this idea, they would be completely allowable. Just look at Hitler and how he viewed the Jews and others who he deemed to be lesser humans. As he attempted to create a perfect race, he was met with condemnation from the world. Why is this? Well, it's because we share in a desire for justice. Animals do not share this. Why did only humans evolve this imposition of morality? Well, that's just it. We didn't. We were created with this desire inherent in our hearts. Now, this leads beautifully into the third point of this whole thing. If God exists, we should expect to live in a fallen world. This is true because we see the biblical account of sin in the garden. Because of this sin, humanity was left vulnerable to disease, pain, and death. Since then, suffering has persisted throughout human history. The ironic thing is, many people believe that this is evidence that God does not exist. People like Dan Barker, Michael Shermer, and Bart Ehrman actively speak and write on this idea that suffering proves that a good God cannot exist. What they don't realize is that without sin, we lose the entire purpose of the gift of salvation. And without that purpose, the word of God itself loses its potency. The absence of sin and suffering would ironically be the real proof that God does not exist. If the Bible is true and God exists, then we should expect to witness a fallen world and a fallen humanity. The imperfections of this world, physical pain and death, natural disasters, they all should be expected if the biblical account is true. And so, we have yet another example of expectations being met regarding God's existence. Now, if we're going to ask ourselves, what should we expect if God exists, then it's equally important to ask, what should we expect if God doesn't exist? Well, we can follow the same formula as the first question. With the details about space, we have perhaps the most comical answer. If God doesn't exist and it all happened by random chance, we simply shouldn't be here. Order does not come from disorder. Design, love, and morality don't come from mindless accidents. And most evident of all, something does not come from nothing. There's a comedian named Pete Holmes who recently went pretty viral for one of his clips where he said, Some people think nothing created the universe, which is the funniest guess. And the nothing people make fun of the God people. They say God doesn't exist. I'm like, okay, maybe. But you know what definitely doesn't exist? Nothing. <laughs> That's the defining characteristic of nothing, is that it doesn't exist. If your nothing sometimes spontaneously erupts into everything, that's a pretty guys.
he hit the nail on the head with this because it hammers down on the very point that we know intuitively. Something does not come from nothing. And so, what should we expect if God does not exist? Nothing. But let's give the other side the benefit of the doubt. Let's say that by some miracle, nothing really did create everything. Even if we get mere existence, we still should expect next to nothing. For life does not come from non-life. Even if some sort of nothing found a way to explode into everything, you still would have non-life. All you'd have is matter. And the reason why this matters is because even if existence and time itself began, you still don't have any change to this. Non-living matter itself does not simply decide to one day become life. Many naturalists have attempted to offer ways in which life came from non-life, but every single one of them has had a fatal flaw. And it brings us back to square one, which is that there's zero evidence that life can ever come from non-life. But even if we allow this to slide too, there are still dozens of hurdles that evolution has to get through that defy science and defy reality. That one single cell that somehow came from non-life has to somehow consume enough to stay alive and grow, even though all that's around it is also non-living matter, and that would not interact with the cell. And with no past experience or any sort of instinctual action, that cell would also have to somehow develop the instincts it needs to survive and hopefully do it fast enough that it doesn't die before it figures it out. Compounding the issue, even if this cell were to survive, what would we expect to see? That cell. The very same cell. In nature, without exception, creatures reproduce after their own kind. Now don't get it twisted. Species and kinds are two separate things. Of course species can interbreed because they are within the same kind. A poodle and a labrador may make a labradoodle, but a poodle and a labrador will never reproduce into a cat or a hamster. Creatures reproduce after their own kind. And so, even if we have allowed all of these impossibilities to occur up until now, we still cannot expect anything that we see today to even exist in the first place, much less exist in the fine-tuned way that is evident through all creation. And this is also where we can answer the question about animals from earlier. See, if God doesn't exist and we just evolved from a single cell, then why are humans and a select few other creatures the only creatures who evolved this desire to create just for creation's sake? There should be more. Ultimately, here's what it comes down to. If God doesn't exist, we should not expect to see what we see today. And if God does not exist, yet we see what we see today, then multiple things that are outside of natural laws, in other words, miracles, must have occurred. And if you're going to believe in miracles, why not seek the one and only God of miracles? If we are seeing what we see today, God must exist. This is precisely all around us, what we would expect to see if God exists. And not just any God, but the God of the Bible. Yes, we're making a bit of a leap here from theism to Yahweh. This is simply the conclusion that we have come to after following the evidence. What about you? This universe, our own world, our bodies, and all nature that surrounds us demands the existence of a creator. Everything that we would expect to see if God exists we see today. This is sufficient evidence to leave behind purely naturalistic explanations for our world. It is our prayer that you have found this evidence moving. If you're not currently a believer in God, I hope that this has motivated you to perhaps at least look into some other options aside from naturalism. If you're a Christian already watching this, I pray that this has bolstered your faith and that you feel a stronger foundation in the truth. And I also pray that perhaps you now are more equipped to have a ready response to anyone who asks you about your faith. For more information on God, the Bible, or any various questions you may have regarding those subjects, go check out the rest of the content on this channel, as well as the content linked in the description below. Thank you so much for watching. Go with God. <laughs> Just like smiling contentedly and smir like smirking at the camera. Smirking.